Annie DeMarco for inviting me to speak. Um, a lot of you in the audience are already pretty familiar with my research, but I'm excited for the opportunity to speak to those who aren't and give some um, greater connection to my story with the mountains. I've never identified as a cat person, so it's surprising to me that I focus so much time and energy on a feline species, the Canada lynx. I recently realized, however, that in elementary school, I did make a poster about lynx for a natural history fair. Apparently, I interpreted natural history to mean studying a species that was historically found in a certain location, but is no longer. Indeed, the lynx's distribution has been reduced greatly from its historical range. This imperiled species may be impacted by human development, including for recreational purposes, which ties into my research. A decade after this presentation, lynx re-entered my life through my interest in winter ecology. They and their main source of food, the snowshoe hare, are both highly adapted to traveling through deep snow. Lynx are dependent on hares, which make up 70% or more of their diet, so researchers can estimate hare population density to determine whether a site could support lynx. Both species, in turn, are dependent on old growth spruce fir forests. The area of such forests is decreasing over time, as is the depth of snow which they are adapted to. Indeed, snowshoe hares and therefore lynx may be especially vulnerable to climate change due to changes in the snowpack and seasonality of snowfall. Fortunately, these species are still supported in the Rocky Mountains, where I carried out my fieldwork. As snowshoe hare and Canada lynx depend on subalpine habitats, they are inextricably linked to mountains. Since environmentalists set fire to Vail Ski Resort, quote, for the lynx, the relationship between these species, their habitats, and the ski industry has been contentious. In contrast, my research to better understand wildlife populations in light of proposed development serves as a unique collaboration between Vail Resorts, the Forest Service, and the University. To study these species, I have spent a significant amount of time on top of two mountains known as Crested Butte and Gothic. From late June to early November, I traveled on steep, difficult terrain to collect data at over 300 plots. I counted snowshoe hare fecal pellets, which might sound unappealing to the non-biologists listening, but, was, but which I truly enjoyed. I also estimated vegetation cover, an important component of these species' habitats. Most of my time, however, was spent hiking to and from my sites. As my study species are found in subalpine environments, my study sites were not too far below the mountain's peaks. Each morning I hiked up, each day I spent searching through the litter and woody debris to find the rebar stakes marking my plots, and each afternoon I hiked down. To say that I came to respect mountains through this experience is untrue, as I have always held such respect. Seeing the Rocky Mountains covered in snow for the first time, and the time after that, and the time after that, was truly awe-inspiring. What I did develop, however, was a personal experience with these mountains. Previously, I only viewed mountains from afar, or maybe spent a day visiting them while on a hike. I don't believe there's anything wrong with being a tourist, but this year I realized spending much more time on and with these mountains. That isn't to say I was a resident, but certainly a longer term traveler. Through my research, I was given the opportunity to spend time off trail in areas that others do not frequently access and, to be honest, might not be advised to. Straight out of a lecture about ecotones, I saw how much the mountains changed from their bases to their summits and from their north to south faces. Last fall, I learned firsthand the meaning of the term glissading after falling and inadvertently sliding just as fast as I would have while sledding on the snow. This summer, I learned that glissading doesn't have to just be restricted to ice and snow, but can also come about with a deep layer of pine needles on the forest floor. I enjoyed these experiences when the mountains carried me to a safe place and frightened when the unsteady terrain was near a cliff's edge or rocky surface. I learned how to, and that I could make decisions when things did become dangerous. Many days I spent sharing the mountains with others, having important discussions while developing our relationships. Some days I spent alone with the mountains, where I worked through personal concerns and learned about myself. Throughout this time, with the sun and sky and canopy above me to marvel at, 
I always felt the rock underneath me, keeping me grounded. As expected, my time in the mountains brought me closer to myself, to others, and to the species I studied. What I didn't expect, however, was how much I came to value the time I spent with the mountains themselves. While this time was just a small blip in the mountains' ancient histories, it has been an important part of my comparatively brief life. My individual connection with these mountains is one I am immensely grateful for and that I hope to recreate wherever my travels, my research, and my life take me. Thank you. Yes, that was so nice, Courtney. Thank you for setting the tone on the story. Um, we don't have enough time for me to tell you my glissading injury stories. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, great. Well, we, we start our world tour now. And uh, uh, Professor Vasquez, uh, would you please introduce uh, Miriam Castillo? Yes, I am so glad to introduce Miriam Castillo. She was my student when she studied sustainable development at Tech de Monterrey. And she has just finished her master at the University of Bristol in environmental policy and management. So Miriam, please share with us your experience in your um, uh, narrative. Please go ahead. Welcome. Hi, hello everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Profe Ricardo for the opportunity and everyone for being here. And I'm going to, sh to share my screen just to uh, tell a little story. Okay. 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 This is Itzel. She's 17 and lives in the Cuzamala region in central Mexico. Oh, sorry. I don't know why is it. Yeah, I don't know what always happens. Um, a very important area able to capture and provide 25% of Mexico City's drinking water. Surrounded by mountains and forests, itself has grown like many Mexican girls going to school and hanging out with friends and also following her grandma's cooking, dressing, praying, and even partying traditions. Her family has a milpa, a Mesoamerican agroecosystem that combines delicious corn, pumpkins, chili, and beans. Over the centuries, this type of agriculture has provided food, water capturing, and soil nutrient retention for her community. Um, yeah, sorry. Oh. However, when Itzel was little, she remembers her own family and many others couldn't afford shoes, farm equipment, or a new TV. Therefore, the men of the Pueblo started selling wood from the mountain to the big cities and to foreign companies. She got a pretty new dress, but as time went by, it still stopped seeing the trees that always joined her on her way to school and even the soil didn't stay on the ground anymore. In 2017, a group of people from Mexico City and the United States arrived to the Kutsamala region proposing the Red Plus program. As a girl who can't go to big meetings, she heard from her dad and uncles what the government of Mexico had to propose. Apparently, many far away and rich people in other countries were very worried about the smoke they produced with their cars and factories. And as they knew itself's community lived in a big mountain, they were going to pay the local people for taking care of trees while making the air clean in the Kutsamala region. In the beginning, everything looked very confusing because itself's family has taken care of plants and soil for so many years. Either way, they wouldn't eat. But these smarty people talk in a lot of terms, explain that clean air from trees is money worthy. Finally, itself's family accepted to be in the Red Plus program. However, as the men spent money to buy alcohol, outsider people decided to give farming materials instead. Itself, itself as a girl didn't take any decision, but was happy someone was interested in the Kutsamalas trees. <coughs> Her dad had to get training to be in the program, which was a waste because outsider people decided to measure the value of itself streets trees by themselves. As the program only gave them a few materials to the Kutsamalas families, they had to go back to their traditional agriculture and also selling wood from the forest again. Also, itself's family didn't understand precisely what to do because many outsider people from different organizations wanted to make decisions and they changed very quickly along with the local government elections. What seemed like a very interesting proposal for itself was not as effective as she thought. 
money was very little and complicated to obtain. And also other people were focused on activities that could actually provide money. After the new presidential election of Mexico, the program stopped. Outside their people, outside their people and the farming materials stopped coming. And again, the interested people on preserving the Kutsamala mountain couldn't do a lot with small help and money like itself. Her family kept her milpa and they are selling again woods in big cities. She knows that they don't need anyone to save them as the Red Plus wouldn't do. But they need to remember again the power of the mountain, how trees share their daily life and how they join everyone on their way to go to school and work, how they provide water, food and wood. It's all things they just need to remember. This is a fictional story based on my dissertation, The Impacts of the Red Strategy in the Mexican Forest Management for the Master's Degree in Environmental Policy and Management at the University of Bristol. With a strategic policy analysis of the Mexican Red Post program, along with 12 interviews with forestry actors, I could understand the perceptions of Mexican people regarding a non-functional Red Plus carbon market, which is now out of the side from current federal administration of Mexico. Itself must be fictional, but this is a very similar story to many shared by Mexican families in forests. Thank you. <laughs> this is incredible, Miriam. Thank you so much. Um, that, was, that was wonderful. And, and the imagery is really, really compelling. Um, just shows the interconnections of so many things. Thank you. Um, our next stop on the world tour is uh, Leone from Perth College, uh, recommended by uh, Martin Price, one of the one of the real innovators in this field uh, internationally. And so, welcome, Leone. Thank you very much. Happy International Mountain Day to to you all. It's great to be here today. Um, yeah, I would like to share uh, some of my research today obviously connected to, to the mountains and I will share uh, my screen as well. Yeah, my name is Leonie and I'm a PhD student at the Center for Mountain Studies, uh, which is based at Perth College, University of the Highlands and Islands in Scotland. Uh, my research looks at recreational impacts in the Kangoms National Park. The Kangoms National Park is located in the central highlands of Scotland and is the largest national park in the United Kingdom. The centre of the national park is also a UK's largest area of high ground, with many of the highest mountains, such as Ben McDuy and Kangom. My research is focused in the western uh, part of Kangos National Park. This area has multiple conservation designations, high biodiversity and the largest area of Scotland's ancient forest. This area is also one of the most popular uh, mountain areas for all different sorts of outdoor activities such as hill walking, mountain biking and skiing. The mountain area is clearly important for both biodiversity and for people. So I got inspired by the storytelling format that John suggested and would like to try and tell the background story of my research in this kind of format. So imagine you were a beautiful Capercaillie living in one of the last remaining parts of ancient pine wood in Scotland. They once covered most of the highlands. Your species had gone extinct in Scotland in 1785 due to hunting activity and habitat loss, but was reintroduced successfully to different parts of Scotland in the 19th century. However, since the late 20th century, your species, uh, species has experienced a major decline again, and only about a thousand individuals remain in Scotland. Some of the major factors that have led to the decrease in Capercaillie numbers include fragmentation and loss of suitable habitat due to direct and indirect impacts. Disturbance of recreationists, especially during the displaying and mating season, like shown in the picture, also play a role in it. Now, imagine if you were showing off your most beautiful to the ladies at your leg side when a group of loud, loud mountain bikers, all the ladies as well as, as, um, as well as your rivals fly away and you must wait yet another day to impress the ladies. 
or the excitement at the lect site make, makes you even more vulnerable to any disturbance of people. But the next day, the same happens again. Only this time, it's a group of trail runners. You've already tried to find a site away from trails and major disturbance, but the forest isn't big enough for the amount of people that keep coming. In Scotland, people have the right to roam, but little are they aware that we also need some quiet places in those last remaining parts of suitable habitat. So people sometimes like to go off the beaten track and come closer to our sites. We understand that they want to visit this beautiful part of Scotland, great mountain views, beautiful uh, pine forests and stunning mountain lochs. We just wish we could share this great area in a better way. Some parts where they can enjoy their mountain biking, walking and running, and some parts where we can go about our business without any disturbance. It is not too late yet for, for us to thrive again. We hope to have the support uh, from lots of organizations and the people who come here. And hopefully rangers can connect more people with nature and make them aware of our vulnerability. Uh, so this is the story that has led to my research study. Uh, visitor numbers are expected to grow, not just because of outdoor tourism and recreation is increasing in general. The A9 motorway, um, which lies in the west part of the National Park and is marked in the maps, is currently being expanded from one lane to two lanes in both directions. This will make it faster and more reliable for visitors to travel to the highlands from main urban areas like Edinburgh. So to provide a little snapshot of my work, um, I have analyzed data from different social media platforms to look at the distribution of outdoor activities in my case study area in order to identify areas of highest conflict between Capacali and outdoor tourism and recreation. So the map on the left shows the woodland cover that is unaffected by infrastructure and mountain biking activity. We can see that these are highly fragmented pieces of woodland. The map on the right shows the intensity of mountain biking around these areas. So it's clearly visible that most mountain biking, biking activity occurs in woodland areas, particularly in the central part of the case study area. This is also the most popular area for most other outdoor activities. The main attraction is Loch Molich, uh, which is the lake that you could see in the first photo. And there's also a beach to the east side of the loch, which is the highest beach in the UK. Due to the large numbers of people recreating in this area, Capacali, particularly to the south of the loch, experience high level of disturbance. Um, I also conducted a Delphi study with conservation and tourism experts in the area and gathered the most important management actions to reduce the conflicts between Capitale and outdoor recreation. Alongside more rangers and better pre-visit information, habitat improvements were regarded as one of the solutions to these challenges. The experts proposed two main habitat improvements, creating bog woodland and tree regeneration. The creation of bog serves three pur purposes. Oops. Um, so bog woodland is one of the designated features of the conservation areas in this part of the National Park and bogs attract insects that Capacali uh, feed on. People avoid bogs and so wildlife ref refugees can be created and also extended naturally. And in a similar way, tree generations can enhance habitats and provide screening for Capacali. So where there's a lot of tree generation, the birds move closer to the tracks. So I guess my answer to the question, why do mountains matter is it supports beautiful wildlife species and is great for outdoor activities. I think this year has shown more than ever how important the outdoors are to our physical and mental well-being. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leon. That's that's really moving and i think the people living here particularly uh identify we have the gunnison sage grouse and recreational challenges to the left mm -hmm. as well one of the one of the great founding researchers around that that unique species is on this call dr jessica young so she may have already been chatting you while you were speaking <laughs> <laughs> our, our 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 great friends uh 
um, from uh, Uganda are, are working feverishly to get the Zoom link to work. And so if we see them appear, we'll circle back. And if they don't, we'll uh, share the recording with them. And perhaps they'll want to share a recording with us uh, later on. So thank you for your patience uh, with them. Uh, from University of Innsbruck, uh, Lorenz, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just a second. Okay. Can you see everything? Perfect. Great. So um, I did a little presentation just like uh, gathering some thoughts and things about my PhD thesis and my work in general. And um, like really things which came to my mind on the question of why do mountains matter. Mm, I'm, although based in the Alps and in Innsbruck in Europe, uh, my PhD project is located in the Andes in Peru. Um, where we have a project I'm going to talk about in detail later, but uh, basic, basically we are, we are uh, working on how climate change and also, also other global change things affect uh, agriculture in the area. So, okay, so maybe a bit to, to a bit better understand what's what's like my history or why for me personally mountains do matter i just uh i just went through my photos and and thought a bit a bit uh thought about it and um then i kind of found that there were many different topics i was i was working on in my professional career um starting from 2010 before i went to university i kind of traveled through europe uh, mainly to mountain areas and visited some universities and this is an example from Norway where I was very interested and uh, in the end I started to study geography in Germany also in 2010 which led me in 2012 uh, I had the opportunity to join a student's excursion to Nepal in the Himalayas um, where we mainly mainly worked on uh, geomorphology and glaciology so I kind of found this could be seen as uh, mountains matter as some kind of archive for climate and just to understand processes. This is also true for the picture which uh, dates to 2014. This is where I did my bachelor thesis. This is the Mont Blanc, highest peak of Europe, and um, I was dating glacier. Uh, I was dating moraines by uh, taking taking cores of trees, doing dendrochronology. So also seeing, seeing mountains as some kind of archives for climate. But then also in 2015, uh, I moved to Innsbruck meanwhile. Um, um, we had a student's excursion uh, to Iceland and worked on all kinds of natural hazards, such as avalanches and rockfall and so on. And so although mountains can be, um, can, can serve um, or uh, can can give people a place to live. They can also be a threat for human life. And uh, finishing my master thesis in two thousand seven, uh, I worked on a topic which was not completely um, related to mountains, but um, I, w I did an internship in uh, another a research facility in Germany. Where I could, uh, where many people were also working on, on on mountain topics, and since last year, um, I work in this project in the Andes, and um, and um, so where many things come together because there's a there's a big history of research there from Innsbruck and other places, and. Uh, in this project, we we work more on mountains as uh, as a place to live and as a place to um, grow food. And of course, as many of you, uh, if I'm not in my office or doing field work, usually you will find me in the mountains too, doing sports or whatever. So this is also an important aspect for me why mountains matter. So. Regarding our project, 
uh, there's an almost 100 year long history of, um, of people doing research from the University of Innsbruck, um, which more started from like a classical geography side and glaciology, um, then later more social and political topics came into place. And since last year, we have this new project where we kind of try to work interdisciplinary um, to see how global changes affect um, the, 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 the livelihood of, um, of small scale farmers in this particular valley. So some words about our project. Mm. So the motivation behind our project is that the, um, the small scale farming is mainly rain fed and it's increasingly, increasingly threatened both by, uh, by, by climate change patterns that uh, rainfall changes or dry periods increase, extremes increase in general. Um, and also there are economic, economic threats as in many Latin American countries there, uh, there is a huge um, economic growth which uh, just like really changes the whole society. Um, and what, what my colleagues found before is that meteorological measurements uh, are very sparse and uncertain. And also they, uh, uh, they interviewed a lot of farmers and they found the, um, the farmers do not perceive the same changes as as uh, as you as you would find in the available data, um, and this incomplete knowledge on both um, precipitation on the one hand and also um, the actual water demand of different cropping strategies uh, hinders the development of sustainable adaptation strategies. This is how this project kind of was born. We are doing um, we are modeling atmospheric. Uh, atmospherical parameters and also crop development. We're doing interviews with farmers. Um, especially I'm doing a lot of, or was doing a lot of plot scale agrometeorological measurements. And since COVID, I kind of started to work more with remote sensing because we cannot go to Peru currently. So get some impressions of, impressions of my field work. Um, this is a typical farm where we, where we were measuring uh, crop parameters and doing interviews. So just to get some impressions. Um, if you want to learn more about the project, you can always visit our homepage, agroglimboras.info. And thanks for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Um, finally, some information about mountain research here in Innsbruck. Here you can see a very recent picture from yesterday. We just received a lot of snowfall. Ah, oh, yesterday. Beautiful. Um, thank you so much, Lorenz. That was excellent. And um, uh, Wolfgang or Stefan, would you like to share anything else about, you know, either Lorenz or his cohort and the larger project? I think Lawrence did a, a good job. Uh, and today, I think it's the stage for all the PhD students who are presenting such amazing uh, stories about their research. If you're interested to uh, collaborate with us, you now have the contact. So we are warmly open for all those who, who laugh, who, who are us, who are, which I've written, <laughs> which I've read in the in the chat. So uh, stage should be open for the youngsters. Uh, thanks for. Uh, providing us the opportunity to share this piece of research done by the Innsbruck group. You bet, you bet. Stefan, would you like to add anything? I just wanted to say that um, we've worked, we had one graduate student, Todd Jesse, work with the Mountain Institute in Peru uh, using uh, geospatial analysis to help in the face of melting glaciers identify ancient Incan water storage systems and to, to sort of revive those as, as a, a way to engage in some climate adaptation. And our own Skylar Congdon, who's our coordinator at the center, is just absolutely loves uh, Hiraz 
and wants to run a course there. So, oh wow, so yeah, we, we also did some teaching there already. Maybe there's if there we are warmly uh, widely open for any kind of exchange on methods and, and possibilities there because we, what, what we learn from each project is that we uh, would need far more knowledge about this and that aspect. So we're very, very happy to get any information from yeah. other research to, to include into our uh, research to get a big, bigger picture of uh, the entire system, system there, which is as complex as in many other Indeed. mountain regions. Well, I, I regret that, you know, the Mountain Institute wanted to replace Todd when Todd graduated, you know, wanted us to send him another student. We didn't have somebody with both the language skills and the GIS skills. We had one or the other. And so I, I'd be happy to connect you with that. And I'm sure Skylar's already reaching out in the chat about maybe co-teaching a course there someday. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. Samita Rana uh, is from the GV Pont Institute in India. I know Dr. Young. And I have brought, uh, have been there. I've brought a class there. It's an incredible campus on the edge of the Indian Himalayas, uh, with views of the goddess Nanda Devi. And so, uh, welcome, Samita. It's such an honor to have you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is a great pleasure to celebrate International Mountain Day with all of you. I just want to share my screen. Uh, so, myself Smita Rana, I am a research scholar from National Institute of Himalayan Environment, Kosika Dharmal, that is in Uttarakhand, one of the state of Himalayan state of India. Uh, I'll be focusing basically, my project is basically focused on the traditional cuisines or nutrition analysis, we can say, of traditional cuisines of Indian Himalayan region, basically focusing on the Uttarakhand region of Himalaya uh, by promoting the villagers to encourage them to cultivate more and more traditional crops so they can get the more traditional foods and by awareing them about the nutritional profile of the traditional food so that this knowledge can be transferred from one generation to other generation and can be this traditional food can be saved for for the future generation also so as uh, the uh, as we all know that there are various agriculture based himalayan superfoods like uh, millet amaranth common beans coarse millet horse gram black soya bean in our research in my research work we have basically selected the food uh, crops that are barnyard millet horse gram black soya bean and rice bean the main uh, reason for selecting these grains as is that as we all know that uh, himalayan region is basically drought prone region uh, having the less quantity of water so these are the uh, grains which are dot prone and they can easily be cultivated in the harsh conditions. So therefore, we have focused on these four uh, crops and their uh, traditional foods. For starting our work, our work has been categorized into uh, three parts. First, we have done the field survey, then the nutritional profiling, and then the um, awareness programs. At first, we have done the field survey in their selected um, uh, villages of nearby, uh, nearby our institute and in Uttarakhand. India. Uh, the field survey is based on the demographic as well as the food frequencies uh, uh, survey. We have this is a map of the area where we have surveyed about the uh, their location and their demographic profile. What's the, what is their demographic profile? Their income, uh, their age, sex ratio, their education, the demographic. Um, is their population, their household income, their major occupation, their sex ratio, and age groups. Similarly, while talking about the uh, on the basis of food frequency questionnaire, we have basically uh, determined the the way they have the uh, they produce the traditional grains and the preference they give to the food. Similarly, like if in their day to day daily patterns, they what kind of food they consume and what is the status of the four crops that we have selected and that are the that are being grown from the since the time millennium in their reason but now they are not growing them it's because they are uh, they are now getting easily available mark they are more uh, attracted toward the market food they are more attracted toward the fast food rather than this traditional food although these traditional foods when we have analyzed are very highly nutritionally rich 
So on the basis of FFQ, the food frequency questionnaire, total uh, production of the different grains uh, like uh, horse gram, barnyard millet, rice bean, and black soya bean, as well as their daily food preferences has been categorized. Uh, later on, we have also uh, we also tried to as uh, we also tried to know their mode of cooking. As first we have surveyed uh, on um, 2017, and later we have surveyed again on 2020. We can see that the uh, there is around 53 percent increase in the LPG gas stoves, which were earlier not available uh, to people in the villages, and they are basically uh, at first earlier they were basically uh, focused on the chulas that are traditional chulas which are being used in India for the cooking but now they have around 50-50 uh, criteria there is almost 53% increase in the LPG gas based stoves from 2017 to 2020. Similarly uh, through the bar diagram we can easily see that among the four crops that has been selected and their production uh, level and on the basis of the, um, their traditional foods that has been prepared in these areas we can uh, clearly depict that people are more aware newly new generation basically focusing on the new generation new generation people are not much aware about the uh, food of the traditional traditional foods and they are uh, basically uh, they basically know two or three crops of horse gram and two three crops of black soya bean similarly they are not um, most of the people are not aware about the crop, uh, food of barnyard millet although the barnyard millet is very highly nutritionally rich so after uh, doing the food frequency survey or demographic survey, we have purchased the grain from the villagers itself as well as the ingredients that are being used in the traditional in the product in the preparation of traditional foods. And then we have prepared the cuisines with the help of a, a woman that is living in that village itself, and she cooked for us in the traditional method only. Then we have done the nutritional profiling. This is the lady who has cooked for us in the traditional way in the traditional chula manner only we don't use gas stove we have used traditionally uh, traditionally used chulas for the preparation of the uh, food products from the different uh, crops now similar we have also done uh, like few grains are uh, have very hard seed coat it's not easy to cook them uh, directly without soaking so few uh, of the crops or few of the uh, recipes require soaking before cooking so we have so we have done the nutrition analysis how much nutrition is being lost while we are soaking or which time or duration is optimum for soaking so on the basis of duration and temperature we have we can easily see that there are various factors which affects the uh, which are uh, which are which basically affects the nutrition profiling of the uh, these grains so and most of the, we have find out that most of the uh, nutrients are being leased out while well, if we soak for around 12 hours any grains and if we soak for an uh, for the limited period then although the nutrition are not leased out but the seed coat is still very hard and the nutrient content are not easily available so and then similarly we have done the nutritional profile can approximate nutritional composition of the food grains that are generally taken by the people and their comparison with the traditional grown crops like these are uh, last four are the traditionally used crops of the study area and while others are the uh, grains or crops we can say that are being easily consumed by them this data is based on the usda usda norms usda norms uh, and these are uh, uh, this is the basically the slide showing the all the traditional cuisines that we have prepared that the lady has prepared for us and then we have took that recipes to the laboratory for the analysis purpose on the, uh, so while we are doing the nutrition composition of traditional cuisines of Uttarakhand uh, India we have seen that most of the uh, cuisines are highly nutritious although we can although these are less consumed underutilized these are the underutilized crops although they have very high nutritious content among all the crops we can uh, easily see that uh, rice bean crops and horse gram crops as well as the uh, barnyard millet crops are highly nutritionally rich other in aspect of minerals or any other content 
similar the nutritional this is also the nutrition composition showing the anti nutrient content as well as the bioactive tradition uh, activity of traditional cuisines of uttarakhand similarly after uh, our, um, the field survey followed by nutrition analysis in the uh, laboratory we have further uh, done the awareness programs among the villages uh, we have done the um, uh, awareness program among the villages we have we just one to one interacted with them and tried we have tried to explain them that the use of their traditionally grown crops which are not which they are not growing nowadays they have just barren their lands they are not doing any cultivation just nothing they are uh, not uh, interested at all in cultivation we have just tried to motivate them just told them how the how good the nutritional profile is of these uh, um, these grains rather than uh, using of rather than having the uh, not so uh, fast food so through this work we are just trying to focus on the conservation of the local culture of the himalayas or the himalayan traditional food so that this food tradition can be passed on to from one generation to other generation so that uh, our future generation as uh, we are we are also not much aware about the traditional food now so our future generation uh, can come to know about them that these non not so tasty traditional foods are also very nutritious than their fast food the fast food although we are having the fast food in a very large quantity but the nutrition content when compared with the uh, traditional foods is not much uh, uh, not much acceptable the traditional food or the few food that are being uh, used from the generations having the more nutrition content Uh, now, uh, on conclusion, I can just say that the popularly uh, popularly consumed uh, cuisines of Uttarakhand uh, of hot gram, black soya bean, millet, rice bean are found were found to be highly nutritious. And uh, while when we compared it with the USDA nutritious norm, and uh, if we incorporate these traditional cuisines in the restaurants or hot hotels, uh, it will be very helpful for linking the ecotourism as well as the rural tourism, and thus enhance the uh, tourism of Himalayas. Indian Himalayas and these nutritious uh, food value can having the issue of can uh, solve the issue of the nutrition security by making these grains on of the system that is being used day to day public distribution system and uh, in the uh, integrated midday meal system. Thank you. Well. Thank you, and you've made us all very hungry. <laughs> um, a really compelling study on on nutrition. Thank you for that, and and I and I think the link with ecotourism, really really smart. Um, everybody should know that the Plant Institute is very close to uh, Machkali, India, which is our sister city, and we'll be taking a class there. Uh, we hope we hope if if everyone can have access to the vaccine, we're hoping sometime this summer. We go once a year, and and we'd love to connect with you there, Smita. I'm really humbled by this work you're doing. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And uh, Dave Primus, were our friends from Uganda able to call in? I'm looking through this. I don't see them yet. I, I know their best. I don't, I don't know the name to expect. Sure, uh, I'm looking. Okay, I'm not seeing them, but there's always time. You can see it built in a nice big cushion. Um, I'd love to welcome uh, Professor Julia Klein, who's, who runs uh, an organization I've looked up to for some time, Mountain Sentinels, and, and she will share a bit about her organization and introduce Anais Zimmer. Welcome, Julia. Great to see you. Happy Thank you. Happy Mountain Day, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Um, great event. Uh, I love to hear what people are doing. Um, for mountains. So what a great celebration. So I'm a professor at Colorado State University. I lead the Mountain Sentinels Network, as um, John mentioned. So we're a group of scientists and stakeholders. We've got about 57 sites around the world and we're working on mountain sustainability issues. Um, as a group, we conduct workshops and we conduct some syntheses of challenges and opportunities um, across the world's <coughs> mountains. We promote and study the process of science working with society um, to identify and implement uh, sustainable pathways to the future. And so our process really values and amplifies indigenous mountain communities and knowledge systems. Uh, we've got a bunch of different programs, but uh, one that's been really successful this year is a fellows program. 
um, for mostly indigenous mountain people around the world, also here in the US and uh, those underrepresented in STEM. And that is our website and I can put the link in the um, chat as well. Thank you for putting that up. So today, um, Anais Zimmer will be speaking with you. Um, she's actually a PhD student at the University of Texas. So she's not at CSU, but I met Anais about five years ago uh, when she was working with local communities um, in the Cordillera Blanca region of Peru through the Mountain Institute. And she's now a PhD candidate extraordinaire. And she collaborates with our Mountain Sentinels group, especially through organizing Mountain Day at the American Association for Geographers. So I thought it would be really um, exciting to share, to have her share her work and her stories with you today. So um, Anais, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, John. Thank you all of you guys to be here today. It's, it's very nice to do the Mountain Day sharing our experience and our research. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here. So my, oops, I think you can see my screen, and if I do that, that will be good. So, and you don't want to see that, I don't know what I can do. Maybe it's better, yeah. So, um, my presentation today is not so much um, unfocused, like focused on storytelling, but I'm going to do my best and try to adapt it a little bit more now. It was a last minute um, decision. So I said, Julia, I work, let's go back to, to Juarez in this world tour. And so I work five years for the Mountain Institute with local community about small projects uh, for adaptation to climate change. And there, my question grew a lot about the deglaciating landscape. So what is happening in this new land that they are emerging after glacier retreat? So I decided to start a PhD and I went to the University of Texas. So now today I'm going to let you know a little bit what I'm doing for my PhD in, uh, in geography. So I'm looking at human environmental interaction in the devastating Alps and tropical land. So I really want to get this out, I'm sorry. Yeah. So because of global warming and ele elevation dependent warming, glaciers are retreating in all the world. And so we can see new land emerging after the ice. And so in this new land, there are a lot of social ecological opportunities and challenging. So for example, we observe new mining in Peru, in Chile, in Bolivia, in the Himalaya, in, oops, sorry, this is automatic, in, Ama, in Himalaya, in Pakistan. And also there are a lot of hydropower industry. We have the local communities as they go, agricultural practices. And there is also the opportunity for altitude migration for plants and for progression soil to form. So it's up here we have a kind of new or novel high alpine community and ecosystem. So my question here is what are going to be these new ecosystem services that we are going to have in this new land? And so there is a real need for the quantification, model prediction to maybe set up adaptive strategy, thinking about a world without glacier. So I work in, um, in nine sites. So in this world tour, we can start in the Alps. So I work in uh, two Pelerange Brulas, Glacier Blanc, and Sorland that they are in the French Alps. And I also have one glacier in the Swiss Alps, just on the other side of the Blanc, the Orny Glacier. And three glacier in the Cordillera Blanca. And one of these glaciers, the Brogi, it's a, a glacier that vanished completely in 2003. So I'm coupling um, floristic and geomorphic survey. So in the picture where you have like the um, orange square and uh, the small uh, red calibration target. So this is a quadra that we use. So we put this quadra on the floor and we, do, so we survey all the plants, we took soil sample and we survey geomorphic and topographic setting. And I, coup I couple this approach with a ground remote sensing approach. So I use a RGN, a red, green, and infrared camera. And I take a picture of this plot. And this allows me to calculate vegetation index. And so to try to estimate biomass production, vegetation development, and ecosystem health. 
So this method allow me to work through a space for time substitution approach. So I use corner sequences of degradation, so you can see this small, uh, this small graph. And also proper this approach, looking at geomorphological setting to understand what are the main driver of ecosystem formation after glacial retreat. And next summer, I plan to upscale this study using UAV and drone photogrammetry. So to get a global mapping of all my nine progression landscapes. So next to this approach, in parallel, I'm looking at what could be a good periglacial land management to enhance ecological transition from recently desglacialized land to productive ecosystem. So my my thinking here is like, if we do nothing, we are going through desertification. And we have to adapt from now. We don't have to wait that we are not going to have glacier to say, oh, the ice is going, and so what can we do now? So my question is, if it's, like, it's government, uh, we are not national government, regional government, local population, maybe they can start to implement some adaptive adaptive strategy in the presently desglacial landscape to enhance ecological formation. And so to be sure that when we are not going to eat ice, we are going to have healthy ecosystems that can provide the ecosystem services that local population needs. So going back to Peru in the Cordillera Blanca and in Huaraz and in the Urashahu Glacier that it's a little bit up to the Oyeros village, I set up an experiment with uh, Indian camelids, so the Lama Glama, and I'm thinking that maybe they can play the role as an ecosystem engineer. And so they can move seed from the lower part of the watershed to the upper part, and so to the desglaciated land because they like, so here maybe it can be a nice story, <laughs> because the Lama, they like to go and walk next to the glacier and visit place just to just to have some time and, and to work there. And so they are like a kind of link between valley, but also between altitude. So they go from below altitude until the ice. And also they can create organic matter, so the fish. Um, I built four fans and four control. And so the fence are 42 by 22 meters. And in each fence, we, I work with a local community. And so we put three lama in each fence during three days, during three years. And so I have permanent plants that they are one meter by one meters. And so each year I go and I survey the permanent plant to study soil formation and plant colonization. So here you can see some picture of, uh, of this experiment. So the guy on the, on the left, it's a, it's a collaborator from the National Park of Huascaran who is helping us with this project. And so we work also with the um, local community of the Yamados Mill Association, that it's a local community that owns, uh, owns the Lama. So yes, yeah, this is all that I have for you now. So I didn't want to give you some results because I don't want to put it like too scientific focus, but I just wanted to let you know what I'm doing. And so if you have more information, I'm will be very, very glad to to share more information for you and take some picture. So, thank you. Well, that's incredible, Anais. And I think Annie speaks for a lot of us in the chat here when she says important future thinking and practice to support ecosystems of transition. Uh, we're doing a lot in our valley with um, regenerative grazing, including some of the work Annie's been involved in. And to see you take it into this level and another side of the world is really exciting. Congratulations and more, you're giving us hope. I thought what we would do as we shift into the Q&A and then move into Julian's sort of global conclusion um, through his Zero Water Day project is when I was working on my dissertation almost 20 years ago, um, oh shoot, it's been 20 years. Anyway, I'm feeling old now. But um, <laughs> uh, when I was working on my dissertation 20 years ago, Julia was giving me the double thumbs up. Um, I, the hardest questions for me, and this is for everybody who spoke today, the hardest questions were the simplest questions. Because what we just saw from all of you was, was a wonderful level of detail supporting your thesis work. Um, that really gave each of us a picture that many of you translated into story, and that's really cool. But when I was asked the simplest question about that project, I had to really pause. And so 
pause and a couple of you already did this, but I'm just asking from your research, and I think this is how we're gonna get a sense of how each of you connect. What's the common thread, right? We've gone from tourism to food systems to wildlife habitat with many points in between. Um, so what holds them together beyond just they all happen in mountains? Why do mountains matter, right? What from your work showed you something new about why mountains matter? And it could just be one sentence uh, that you share. And uh, I, I'm not gonna force the order here, but I'd like to hear from each of you. Um, what moment from your research, what aspect of your research, or just one sentence from your research, why do mountains matter? Um, yeah, maybe I will start. Um, I guess I've already answered the question a little bit or um, towards the end of my uh, talk. Um, I guess with my sort of research is that we have beautiful mountain areas in Scotland and we love to visit the mountains, do all different sorts of outdoor activities in mountains because it's so beautiful. Uh, but we also need to be aware that there's other species around um, who also appreciate the mountain, the mountain habitat. Um, especially in that uh, mountains are a matter for us, um, for the physical ex exercise, for our mental well-being, but also for uh, biodiversity. So many beautiful species in mountain areas. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Why do mountains matter? Miriam? Yes, hello. Um, so I have always had a very academic approach towards forests and mountains from my undergrad and at the beginning of my master's. But as I came to understand more what Mexican people had to say about the perception, their perception to forests, I just noticed that mountains and forests matter in the most, like you were saying, the most simple and complicated way because they matter for just as you go to school and see trees, as you cook something for your daily meal, as uh, you bring wood to keep you warm or to make what we do here is barbacoa in Mexico. It's like a lamb, like a very nice dish. You no, know, so that's like, it's, it relies more in, it, it is more than just like an academic and, 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 a very scientific approach for people it's just their way of living and that's i suppose that for all of us what we just have disconnected from nature and um it relies more on how we spend our daily life and when i was in the uk i was just very I was very thirsty about being surrounded by mountains here in like here in mexico we have big, big mountains. And we live, well, here in Puebla, I live next to a volcano called Popocatepetl, which is like a very beautiful volcano. And I just felt so thirsty about seeing that daily and just being in awe by nature. And I think that's something that we tend to forget in academic, um, like academia, we tend to forget that, but actually, the most simple is what matters the most. Yeah, well put. The, the, the mountain, right, is such a physical manifestation, a, almost a portal into all the ways in which nature sustains us. Uh, who else would like to share? Why do mountains matter? I, um, I just wanted to share that for me, this question of why mountains matter um, is a little bit difficult because I grew up very close to nature in the Sierra Nevadas and I believe that the mountains raised me as much as my own parents did and so asking what like mountains are a piece of my identity and asking why they matter is like asking me why it's important to breathe or drink water. Like it's a part of my life and I can't separate myself from it. And that's why I'm so passionate about 
bringing um, nature and environmental education to other places because I think that connecting to nature and to the mountains helps us discover who we are and to reconnect ourselves with a deep uh, place inside of ourselves um, that can teach us about how to live. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how to explain it beyond that, um, but mountains are, are so incredibly special to me. Um, I, I really think that they have helped me discover who I am as a person and to empower myself to create things in my life that I care about. So thanks for letting me share. Thank you for that. I love the opening, Lizzie, about how it, it just, it, it's so uh, ubiquitous, it's hard, it, it's almost absurd to define. Uh, Julia, I saw you nodding a lot there. Did you want to add to that? No, I mean, I think Lizzie said exactly what um, I feel as well, just that um, there's no separation between almost, um, you know, we, we all work in mountains, we want to advance actions in mountains, but there's just this deep spiritual connection and it, our essence. I've always thought that I was like, I'm a reincarnated uh, pastoralist from a high mountain area, you know, because where is this like this, this deep pull is, is um, it's, it's, it's so like intrinsic to who I am and all of the really important moments in my life have occurred in mountains. My son took his first steps on the Tibetan plateau when he was 10 months old and um, I met my husband kayaking on the river. So it's, um, you know, again, it's, it's such a, a passion and essential nature of, of um, who I am. So I just really, really, that really resonated with me, Lizzie. So thank you for sharing. I don't think I could say it any better than you did. Yeah. I was going to mention your son's first step, so I'm glad you did first. I've, I, I've ne I'll never forget that when you told me that. Uh, any other presenters want to share uh, why, why do mountains matter? Yeah, I kind of... Yeah, please, Courtney, go ahead. I agree with um, a lot of what was just being said in this. You know, it's a, difficult to answer that question, and I think there is something for a lot of us that just draws us to mountains, you know. I find myself any anytime I'm around a mountain just for whatever reason you just want or have to look at it um, and I guess some phrases that I would uh, come to think about our support or foundation you know in terms of a biodiversity um, aspect you know mountains support different vegetation which then supports the wildlife um, like Miriam was saying, they support people's livelihoods and provide food and, um, you know, whether it's a, a part of just being alive or, or enjoying life, I think um, mountains kind of allow for other things to build upon them um, that support us and other beings. Yeah. That's all. Basis of life and livelihood. That's all. <laughs> and, 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 and inspiration. Um, my my nine-year-old who, who loves to ski uh, will add that she feels like she's walking on clouds when she's skiing down a mountain. And she she asked me, well, if it's where, you know, where the water for all the life of the West begins, and I feel like I'm walking on clouds, you know, how, how are they not gods? So it was interesting from a child. Lorenz, you, you, you sort of hit it on the head when you were giving your presentation, but I wonder if you wouldn't mind repeating that section of your presentation, Why Mountains Matter. Um, not quite sure to what exactly you're referring to right now, sorry. Which section exactly, sorry? Well, you could speak from the heart as well. I just remember you saying in the middle of your talk, you, you said mountains, mountains matter because I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, do it, please. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just... 
I'm not not quite sure what exactly you meant. I th I thought I mentioned some some aspects which came to my mind. Like, like yeah, yeah. If you wouldn't mind repeating that, and you don't have to. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, yeah, the, uh, one of your slides. Sorry. No, no worries. No worries. I did not mean to put you on the spot there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, why don't we open it up here? Does anybody else who presented want to share their answer to, to that basic question? And then, um, Professor Meyer, I don't know if you wanted to add anything um, from the perspective of all the work that you do for mountains in in Innsbruck, really serving mountains around the world. <laughs> Having trouble hearing you, I apologize. But why don't we open? Why don't we open up to questions? Does anybody have you know questions for any of the speakers, all of the speakers, um, or do speakers have questions or comments for each other? I just like to kind of open it up. You're welcome to put your question in the chat if you're you know shy about the open forum. Maybe I just can quickly add something because I'm at the moment, my system seems to work best here in Innsbruck. Probably that's why the others don't work anymore. <laughs> so uh, I think one particularity, it's not only uh, about mountain research, it can also be about research in cities, is that you do research where you also live, where you have emotions with, if you're an uh, atomic physics or physics research or something like that, you, pr you don't live in your reactor, so to say. You, you have much more, I think, you have much better, stronger separated between research, your work environment, and your private life where you spend your, your free time, right? So, so for us, it, it melts. It's, it's, it, it's this melting of everything and, and you can do hard research and suddenly you have a special situation where it gets spiritual, uh, you know, this, this religious moment where you, you have a special situation. And I think this is, this is luxury that we, we, we have. If, you, if you're open-minded, if your heart is open to that, you can have this both. You can do research in a surrounding uh, where you also have this special, special moment and, and can get a lot of feedback from your uh, surroundings. And, uh, yeah, that's that's something I always I'm very lucky uh, about that I have the chance to to combine this and that, that not um, that my my passion my my research is is related also to what I uh, really was learned when I was a child to to to, to just have uh, open eyes in the landscape and 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 watch what what is happening and and, and this is really this is it, it's it's kind of a uh, a sy sympathetic science, maybe something like like that. It's it's just just great um, to have uh, the chance when you go mountain biking or whatever to also have an eye on your research, and on the other hand, when you do research, to also have an eye on rest. So that's it, I think. And uh, uh, sorry that I'm not a native speaker because I really support uh, what was said before. If you're born in the mountains. You can't describe why they are important. It's just part of your life. It's it's part of you. You, you would cut part of your heart when you uh, have to move outside the mountains for long. So <laughs> I love many it. Of Thank you. But that was always we were a bit afraid of. Nice. I, I really like that. You know, and, and there's a nice comment here from your colleague uh, Stefan. Uh, mountains are extreme, and this is fascinating. And from a scientific point of view. Looking at extremes gives a lot of insights into systems, right? And uh, I, I'm not going to put words into your mouth, Stefan. I'll just say what it, what that triggered me to think about in, in many ways in the way that edge habitats are are spaces of such vibrance, um, ecotones, or spaces of such ecological diversity. I think that's also true socially uh, in mountains. That <clears throat> you know we have a sixty something day growing season here in Gunnison. <coughs> For food this year, I think it was only 50, and so to the extent that we can figure out 
sustainable food systems here, right? It's a beacon of light for the possibility of doing it <clears throat> in less extreme environments. Same with say green building and heating of homes to the extent that we can build a carbon net zero heating system in, in green homes, well insulated homes, <clears throat> it's easier everywhere. Um, and I don't know if Ricardo, if you wanna to add to that uh, while I get a glass of water, since you do so much work on sustainable communities, that, that idea of the extreme, I think Stefan means that ecologically, but I'm curious, Ricardo, as a renewable energy engineer, if in mountain communities there's something about the extremes that teach us about sustainable systems. Yeah, thank you, Dr. John. I'm so glad to be here and to um, share something and my views about mountains. I think in mountains um, approach and the life we live in mountains, it's so important to consider society and culture. And uh, as long as we have so much diversity in the geography of mountains and reaches along the world, we have people, villages, and ways of life, and ways to support life in around the world. So then, as we have that diversity, then we have to figure out different solutions. Because in the mountain living and the geography we have, there are different challenges, of course, with food systems, water, energy, and nowadays, this is becoming more challenging with climate change. So, um, I think there are big opportunities for us to contribute to sustainability, to resilience, and to think very creatively, integrating multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary technology with economy and society together to make this more sustainable. The, uh, I'm so glad <laughs> that the next year I will be there with you, working within the course of food, energy, and water, and the nexus, which is a very integrative approach that can give us strategies to solve and, and attend these challenges. Thank you, John. Thank you, my friend. And, and I wonder if, if more on the ecological side of, of, of extreme systems that Professor Meyer is talking about, if Dr. Young or Dr. Russell. Dr. Russell, one of our professors here, uh, works on snowpack and watersheds and, and water quantity and um, I'm curious if, if that comment spoke to you at all, Micah. About extremes. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, my, my recent work has been around remote sensing of water supply, particularly snow, snow hydrology, and looking also at downstream effects. So how much water is available to downstream ecosystems, downstream human uses, uh, particularly as we are seeing the land, the uh, resource shift dramatically. So we're seeing significantly less snow or less predictable snow, I should say. Um, and so we are shifting into a pattern of, uh, you know, being re reasonably able to predict, say, the last day of melt or the first day of melt off to now having snow arrive um, very uh, very intermittently and melting off and coming again and melting off and so this creates challenges for both ecosystems uh, and how we restore ecosystems as well as uh, challenges for human environments and I work at the crossroads of the two so I'm very interested in um, looking for partnerships that we can build between private, public and private landowners and public and private land managers uh, with respect to those resources. And so I would echo Ricardo in the sense that I don't think you can disentangle um, these issues around uh, natural resources and community needs. And, we're sh and, and looking at the, that nexus through the lens of increasingly wide error bars on our ability to predict what we have going into the future and what we can reasonably assume will be available to us. So in any case, um, it's an exciting field. It's also a rather scary time to be tackling these subjects. And so all of you 
are doing really important uh, facets of this work to understand our mountain environment in the years to come. So that's my piece. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you for that. And Professor Meyer, please put in the chat if we're missing any part of your comment you need to add. I think it's a really compelling prompt. Um, you know, again, on that range, and you're right, Ricardo and Micah, it, it, it's not a dichotomy. Um, you know, livelihoods are embedded in, in ecosystems. And I think the mountains show us that more than a lot of uh, ecoregions. Um, I wonder, you know, along that spectrum, we have Dr. Kate Clark, she runs our Cold Climate Food Center. Dr. Young researches uh, Dennis and Sage Grouse. I'm wondering if, if either of them have anything to add about this idea of the importance of studying extremes and how mountains help us think about systems everywhere. Um, feel free to add, um, or if anybody who's spoken today or anybody else on the call wants to contribute to this conversation around how mountains help us think about extremes that, that's applicable for all systems. Jess, I see you unmuted. Thank you. I just want to say, well, two things. Um, fantastic presentations, everybody, and great conversation. Much like Dr. Russell was saying, ecologically, it's at the edges that we learn the most. When I was first a graduate student, one of the things that my professors told me is pay attention to the outliers never set them aside. It's the outliers that will teach you the most about what the processes are that are going on physiologically, environmentally, through the complicated ecological webs of life. And I think that's how I see mountains in an era of climate change. They are often um, going to be the first impact of both the communities and the ecological systems, and they can really teach us the most about what we must do and learn to respond to them. So again, thanks for uh, opportunity to comment and such great presentations today. What an honor. You bet, you bet. Uh, thank you, I completely agree. It was really incredible. Um, I'm gonna just let the silence hang for a minute and see if anybody wants to add to this conversation or they wanna pose a question to a speaker or all the speakers. I choose the chance to just thank you in front of the entire audience again for organizing uh, this. Uh, I like uh, this very open format because uh, it shows or it allows for much more creative presentations than we usually see. And I think this is a very nice add on to the usual science uh, presentations and exchange we have, which I also value, but uh, especially here on a Friday afternoon, that's, that's perfect. <laughs> really inspiring. Oh, good. Well, I, and I have to thank Dr. Jenny DeMarco for that. In her MS Ecology program here, she had had all our students do those three-minute stories I sent you all. Why don't we shift to our friend Julian uh, Fisher, who's doing an incredible project uh, called Zero Water Day in partnership with UNESCO and UN Mountain Partnership. And I think, Julian, the, 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 the geographic breadth of the work you're doing um, I think may tie a lot of these, these comments together. Um, and so I'm so glad you can join us, Julian. Happy Mountain Day. Thank you very much, John. Um, I'll just put uh, my slides up there. I think um, exactly, and it's a, a nice, uh, good, good uh, I would say good afternoon, everyone. This uh, afternoon in, in uh, Germany, just um, a little bit below Hamburg, which is on the coast and to the uh, the south and to the, the west of, of Berlin. So again, thank you very much, John, for the opportunity to speak to everyone today and um, some really excellent presentations. So um, congratulations to the speakers. Uh, really, really very, very good. And I suppose um, just picking up on Jess's comment there at the very end, you know, the mountains have an enormous amount to teach um, us and we can learn from um, the communities in those mountains. So I think that's really where uh, my presentation comes from. It's kind of weaving together, if you like, collecting all the things that we've been discussing today and saying, well, you know, how can we use those? I mean, particularly um, um, from Leone, 
um, you know, we know a lot. We know that the, the environment's been impacted by use. People are spreading, you know, particularly e-bikes here in, in Germany. People are traveling further into the mountains and there's just more impact. And I think the key thing is, you know, what can we do about it? So as John said, a um, little bit of background about myself. I'm actually from the health sector, um, but a passionate climber. So I suppose I'm climb, uh, combining the two. Um, and I've been working in policy for UNESCO and for WHO. Um, uh, WHO for around health workforce education, so looking at planetary health and human health. And then um, UNESCO, again, looking at um, education for sustainable development in schools. So um, I've done quite a lot of policy work there. And it's always been for me um, a question of, well, you've got to translate that policy into to action. You've got to translate it into to doing something, testing, seeing if um, what you do actually works, and then taking those experiences and then putting them back into into the policy. So the idea of this zero water day came from a time when I, I was uh, living and working in Cape Town in South Africa and also climbing on Table Mountain. Um, and the 2018 um, Cape Town almost ran out of water completely. So uh, the government had to um, encourage the population to be aware that um, uh, water is a precious resource and it's not always going to be around and you can't it take it um, for a for a given. And so they called it the, the 18th of April 2018, the zero water day when Cape Town would effectively have no water, there would be 200 standpoints around the, uh, around the region and people would have to get uh, a set amount of water and the, these, air, these water stations would be guarded by the, uh, by the army. So what I decided to do as um, yeah, again many of the speakers have been referring to the sustainable development goals is, is take the the teaching and the resources that UNESCO has developed around education for sustainable development, um, particularly around the SDG target um, four, um, saying that this, this should be translated into universities and also into schools. So I actually teach at, um, at schools in, in, um, in, in Europe on this. Uh, Luki, can you give me two seconds? I'm okay. Sorry, my son's just come into the room. <laughs> Um, so this, this project, the Zero Water Day, is, is really taking this work and then translating it into um, work in schools. What we've done, or what we've been able to do, is um, get 24 schools in 14 countries. So we've got schools in Bhutan and India, the Palestinian territories, uh, Brazil, uh, Malawi, Mozambique, uh, Scotland, um, um, Canada, and also very nicely in Colorado in, in the States. And through that, uh, that policy work and that work with UNESCO, we've got a, a common learning plan. So there's a, a learning plan um, that all those schools will, will follow, but it's driven by the children. So the, the learning plan is an iterative process. It's over a year uh, and the children have got um, uh, sort of seven steps where we give them resources, but they will then um, craft and interpret those, those that learning into then into their own action. So it's very much, I think some of the, and Jess was saying, we need to uh, encourage a younger generation to take all this information and say, we are going to be um, uh, the guardians and we also be the, the uh, um, living in the environment that, that is being created now. So we need to take an active, um, take an active role. And we also develop, develop this idea of the planetary weather station, because one of the things we found was that children from all over the, the world in these different countries, they want to connect, they want to learn from each other. And um, they go out on the Fridays for Future demonstrations, but as often um, not, not related to, to action. And people think of global as somewhere other than where they actually are. And again, the idea of this project was to start connecting the, the children um, in these different schools from around the world, and then uh, allowing them to sort of measure their water have a look at the mountains, as we've been, been hearing about. The mountains are critical because it gives you that visual representation of what could be happening to the, um, to the, to the, to the world through climate change and these bigger changes. And as Jess said, it's exactly these peripheral areas that we're seeing now that for children, um, they can actually um, digest and, and, and really start to understand. So as I say, it's a common, a common learning um, steps. Um, that the children will drive. Um, and again, looking at uh, sort of multi-generational. So 
Um, the children will measure their own water use in their houses, but also speak to their parents and their grandparents to try and get that historical perspective and that, um, that intergenerational dialogue going on. And I suppose this is where the mountain comes in because um, a lot of the, I mean, Leone again and, and a lot of the other presentation uh, pre presenters were making this linkage between sort of the human impact on our environment and the, the mountains are incredibly fragile. Um, we can see the glaciers uh, retreating and they are a very good, if you like, a canary in the mind of what um, uh, we potentially are going to be dealing with in the, in the future. So again, this idea of planetary health, linking it to the health of people and, uh, and linking it to the health of the, the children. And um, again, the, the health of communities, um, the World Bank did some, some research showing that the health of communities is very much related to the ability of those communities to adapt and respond to climate change. And again, if we're starting to, a lot of these schools are based in mountain areas, so we can start looking at the health of the, of the communities, linking it to water, and then linking the water to the climate change uh, story. So again, the, the, the mountains are um, important because they're good symbols, visual symbols of, uh, of change. And again, schools that aren't close to the mountains can learn from the schools that are, um, and then get that sort of very personal connection and that personal story. And again, part of the learning plan, um, as we've been discussing, people do their own small research areas, but the key thing is how can we bring this all together? And a lot of the children are saying, yes, we understand all these things, but what can we do? And we want to do something now, and we want to do something tangible. So again, it's taking all that complexity and the sustainable development goals allow us to um, disaggregate and to perhaps develop a more um, uh, coherent or an easier way of looking at all the, the different issues and how they all link together. So the learning plan takes um, uh, some of these complex issues using entry as the, the water, uh, it, water as the entry point, using the sustainable development goals and the children can then sort of map out all the different connections and then take into action. Here's a, uh, a, a, the school in Bhutan have then gone out into the community and say, how can we take this learning, transfer it into action uh, do something um, positive and inspiring, engage the community, getting the community to link into what the school's doing, but then also saying, how does that learning, did that learning do what we hoped it would do in terms of leading to action, and then taking that through back into the, into the policy arena. And then, I suppose to finally, to, to, um, to summarise, all that learning, all that action between these 14 schools will be taken forward to a workshop just before the COP26 meeting in Glasgow next year. Um, and the children will have an opportunity to present their work, um, hopefully um, either in person, one or two of them in person, if not, then, then virtually. Um, we're going to be doing a, a small ebook and film about the, uh, the project, um, particularly around the learning steps so that we can s synthesize and bring together all that learning, that common narrative, and then obviously disseminate it to, to other schools. And then hopefully to build up um, some learning around what is education for sustainable mountain development. Again, drawing on all this wonderful experience and research that we've heard about today and saying we need to start making a younger generation much more more aware of um, what they can do and the evidence so that they can start um, planning for action in their own areas and learn from all this wonderful um, work that's being done, uh, very visual in its, uh, its impact. And um, we're hoping to launch then uh, another sort of a follow-on initiative around education for sustainable mountain development in uh, 2022. So that is in a nutshell what we're uh, trying to achieve and I suppose um, um, why mountains matter for me is I'm a climber and um, traveling to, to climb in the Alps when I was 16 was, um, on a train. The train swings round just before you get into Chamonix at the base of Mont Blanc. And my, probably one of my most powerful memories was um, seeing Mont Blanc, a uh, big dome. It looked like a huge dollop of ice cream. Um, and John, I beat you by 10 years. That was 30 years ago. And if you do the same train trip now, the, the glacier is gray and you get this very sort of small little dollop on the top. So even in the course of my lifetime, those glaciers have retreated enormously. And you do wonder in the next 30 years whether that train journey will just see uh, a rocky mountain. So I think 
mountains do matter and they're an incredibly visual um, representation, as Jess was saying, around the extremes that we're seeing today of what potentially will become the norm in, in the next 10 or uh, 20 years. So over to you, John. And uh, again, from my side, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Congratulations, uh, Julian. Uh, let's all hear it for Julian. Thank you. Incredible work. Um, and Professor Karen Halsdorf has joined me here. She's mentoring Matt Jones, who's a, the MEM student who will be assisting Julian uh, with this network. Julian, can you quickly, I don't know if you, I'm sure you know them by heart, list off the countries uh, with participating schools. Um, very good, okay. Uh, so we've got Bhutan. Well, there's two schools in Bhutan. We've got four schools in India. Um, we've got a school in Mozambique, a school in Armenia, a school in Georgia, a school in uh, Nigeria, a school in Malawi, school in Scotland, schools in Brazil, a school in Colorado, and a school in Canada. So we've Incredible. got many of the school, many um, sort of the, the regions done. The school children range from probably sort of 10 or 11 to, to 15, 16. So, um, and we're having a second Skype call next week where we're hoping to get the children to actually start meeting each other and start talking to each other. So exciting, so excited for that project. And just to give people a sense of how much of a labor of love and passion project this is for you, uh, what is your professional background, Julian? Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> you are putting me on the spot. Um, Long story, I'll, I'll miss out the first bit, but I worked um, in an HIV uh, TB hospital in South Africa for a couple of years and then I worked for the British Antarctic Survey um, and then sort of came back into to Europe um, and I've been doing sort of public health. So I, I think the public health and then education. So um, yeah. worked for a lot of UN agencies when I, I stayed in Geneva uh, and now working in public health. So again, I suppose coming through public health, through sustainability and then linking it to mountains. And it is incredible how the children respond to the, the mountain story. So, I mean, it's great to be able to take some of this research and Leonie, I'd love to follow up with you because this type of, and the, and the lady in, in India as well, because it's those Lisa. small um, stories that really the children resonate because they can say, that is someone doing something that I can, I can use. So um, wonderful opportunity, John. So thank you very much. But again, great opportunity to take research and then spread it through all the, the schools. And if that works next year to sort of scale it up. Wonderful. And everybody in the chat here, I've put a nice article about both Julian and this project for you to dive in more, a little more deeply. And I'm seeing this is this, I'm hoping everyone can, can, can stick around because uh, our friends from Uganda have been able to join us. Uh, is that uh, Professor Bob and colleagues, are you there? <laughs> All right, happy, happy International Mountain Day. Happy National, uh, International Mountain Day too. Uh, glad to see glad you. you could figure out your connection and and I know we're all really grateful you could make it and uh, your story last year about environmental education was really memorable from your your graduate student and um, we we have time you, you came in just in time we have recorded this and so you'll be able to see all the stories that were shared before you arrived um, and uh, and just so everybody knows um, uh, you know, Professor Bob's been a great colleague uh, to us, and uh, we're really grateful. So, uh, uh, go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, John. We we uh, we have to apologize first of all for the delay, but just because we are on, we are attending the international uh, mountain day celebration by the Mountain Partnership and we delayed uh, transferring to this one. Uh, but um, I don't know how far you've gone, but we have the students here who are waiting, eagerly waiting to present their views. Yes, please, you are the conclusion. I beg your pardon? You are the conclusion. You and your students are the conclusion for our day. You are- Ah, yeah, maybe the, the students can say something. How far have you yes. gone? Uh, we, 
we're doing great. And this is our, you are our final presentation. So you, you will get the last. We are the final presenter. Yes, so go ahead. Oh yeah, oh yeah, guys. The, the presentation, please. Uh, shortly, shortly they're coming. Welcome, welcome. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Guys, I told you to do something. So how is that? You can still log from there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they are connecting. Hmm? So we just present without sharing. You have to, you have to share. You put it there and you share. You have to share from the others. You have to share to get my chat. Oh, oh. You yeah. have a presentation there on that. You have to, because you share with the I don't know. No, what what is it required you to put the thing on the CV so that you can share with this? Uh, the flash on the flash. And then you could share. Uh, John, <laughs> sorry, the, the, we are trying to put to load the they are trying to load the presentation and then they, they can present. But you could begin. Okay, and while we're waiting, everybody. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry for that delay. It's okay. While we're waiting, everybody, okay. just a reminder: we have a, a fun uh, Instagram story and photo contest. Thanks to our uh, Mount Resilience Core students. Uh, uh, Lizzie made this poster here, and um, just as a way of making International Mountain Day even more interactive. Um, you can share a mountain biodiversity story and submit photos and prose via Instagram uh, by December 20th. Um, and you just want to tag us as Center for Mountain Transitions and add these two hashtags on Instagram. And um, the top stories will be featured in Colorado Central Magazine. So you'll have a, a, a publication for general readers. Um, first prize photo, we'll make a beautiful print and send it to the winner as well as hang a copy in our center. And the first prize pros will be in our, our Gunnison Times and of course on our, our website. And so, um, yeah. So if you have any questions about that, just, just let me know and spread the word. Okay. And if your slide deck does not work, I thought the presentation. I'm trying to open. I'm trying to open. It was. It was verbally so good last year that it, it's okay if the slides don't work. Enjoy listening. Sorry. Okay, so you're going to share the screen. So let's let's. Okay. Share. Share. So John. Hello. There it is, perfect. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> go into the... <laughs> okay, happy International Mountains Day, everyone. Are you hearing us? Okay, my name is Kaima Patrick and we are going to co-share with my colleague who is Lydia Singula. These are, are, my, are my fellow colleagues. We are all students. Uh, for mountain resource. We are going to present about, uh, oh, we are going to highlight the roles and challenges of mountain biodiversity in, in Uganda. But before we go there, uh, we need to give you a background of our country. We are in East Africa, and the, the total land area is uh, 41550 square kilometers. However, about seven to nine percent of the total area is occupied by the mountains, 
in the country. When it comes to the population, uh, we are about 44.7 million, but about 11% of the population, our population uh, live in mountain. So 11% of our population is in the mountain regions, which are uh, which is the seven to nine percent. Our total pop our population is majorly composed of the youth, and the seventy-seven uh, percent of the people there are the youth, including including us. So, what is the how is the status of uh, uh, biodiversity in Uganda when we talk about uh, mountain biodiversity in Uganda? How is it all about? Uh, we can majorly look it into a uh, rural perspective. We can talk about uh, the flora and the fauna. When it comes to the uh, animal species, we have got a lot of uh, animals that do occupy the mountain areas of, of our country. Talk about the uh, southwestern part. Those are the Mohangura ranges. We have gotten the mountain gorillas there. The major population of these gorillas is found within these mountains. When it comes to the uh, tree species, we have got uh, different tree species within uh, our, 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 our mountains. For example, the mountain Renzoli, we have got a lot of them and they provide opportunities to us, we as Ugandans and the the neighboring countries, since major of the mountains are uh, transboundary. We have also got a lot of uh, things that uh, do benefit from uh, blessing on the biodiversities that we do have from our country. The major importance is what are the uh, How are, uh, how are we benefiting from this with the Ugandans? When it comes to biodiversity of mountains in Uganda, we majorly focus on mountain regions when it comes to research and education within our country. We majorly emphasize this simply because uh, our mountains are water towers. Most uh, of the waters that are being used within the eastern region, the western region, and other parts of the country are majorly got from uh, this biodiversity. Talk about the agriculture that you do, we do benefit from. You know our country is a backbone. Uh, we be majorly based on agriculture as uh, our major economy. But most of the food that we usually eat within Uganda and mm that is being exported from the neighboring country is being grown from these, these mountains. Talk about the vegetables that we do usually grow from the Eregon region. A lot of vegetables are being brought in into the lowlands from the mountain areas that we do benefit from. We can also talk about the potatoes in the Luchiga region. So all those are benefits that we are usually benefiting from. Uh, another importance of this biodiversity is the tourism. You know, before the pandemic, uh, we have been growing at a higher rate when it comes to tourism. So when it, we talk about tourism in our country, you cannot uh, neglect the mountain biodiversity because most of the areas that are being visited within our country are found within these areas. Let me hand over to my colleague to start from here. All right, thank you, my colleague. So I'm going to look at the challenges in biodiversity conservation. Many things have hindered the way to conserve the biodiversity we are having in mountains. Lack of awareness. Most of the indigenous people, institutions, and other people, policymakers, they are not aware about the most important things of biodiversity in mountains around Uganda. So with that lack of annoyance, like knowing what they are, they've gone ahead to destroy the biodiversity that we are having. So to cope up with that, we have to make more sensitizations about the awareness of the importances of biodiversity. Then we look at the population and development pressures. Most of like around the world, within Uganda, people are giving birth now and then. 
And this has promoted co population pressure to the available by diversity. Due to like they are trying to get food, they are, there is food insecurity. So they've gone ahead to grow out, uh, to carry out agriculture, meaning that they are destroying, encroaching the forests within the mountains. And that has led to ignorance in biodiversity conservation. Low prioritization. The government policymakers, they've not prioritized conserving the biodiversity in mountains. And this has hindered the conservation of biodiversity in mountains. Let's talk about climate change. It's all over the world. People are carrying land use changes like agriculture, urbanization. And this has led to the encroachment on the ecosystems around Uganda, which has led to hindrances in biodiversity conservation. Let us go to the way we can conserve our biodiversity within the mountains. Harness the innovative spirit of young scholars in biodiversity issues. Here, what we, are, what we can do to conserve the biodiversity is to engage in the youth. How? We make clubs so that they come up, you teach them that don't look at mountains as mountains, mere mountains. Look at them like they have a lot of importance to the development of the nation and the development of the biodiversity. So we have to instill into the youth how to conserve the available biodiversity. We talk about habitat conservation. Most of the species talk about animals and plants. Most of their habitats have been encroached on. Talk about wetlands, you talk about mountains, forests. So they have nowhere to live, so they are in their extinction. So what we can do is advise the government, policymakers, so that they can conserve the habitats, so that they can live longer. Then we leave another point, linking local level mountain issues to global forum through research, outreach, publications. We can invest more into research through schools, universities, such that and other policymakers around internationally and locally so that we can come up and make good research on how to conserve the biodiversity in mountains. And then captive breeding and seed bank. Most of the species are in their extinction. So what we can do, we can make animals breed under supervision we collect many seed plants so that we can keep them for the future generation so that when these are in the extinction period, we can replant, we can introduce more sperms so that animals can breed the local native animals and we can grow the seeds so that we can bring back the plants that have been in the extinction period. Thank you very much. Happy Mountains Day to everyone on the platform. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that was the, the sharing of the by the students. Um, uh, you've heard that the I think uh, the, the unfortunate that they have missed the other bit there, but there could be questions which you could to them and then they, they are able to, to respond. Stop sharing. This is incredible. Thank you so much. And thank you for two years in a row focusing on, on youth and, and youth innovation. And I'm really struck by 70% youth population. Um, it's so important the work you're doing. Uh, thank you so much for, for getting in here and sharing. We have a lot of people on the chat who you know, are really passionate about empowerment of youth for uh, for building long-term mountain resilience. So again, I'm so glad you were able to get the Zoom to work and sneak in. Um, and uh, I, uh, I just want to thank everybody uh, on, on this International Mountain Day. I hope we can all do it again next year. And I hope you can find a way to enjoy mountains today. I know after visiting Shannon's high school class on why mountains matter today, I will find my way up to the ski area. Um, <laughs> and then at 5 p.m.
uh, right here on the same Zoom. If anybody's interested, we are presenting our Mountain Leader of the Year Award to the woman from our government who ran the COVID-19 effort. And um, I just hope all of you uh, in your families, in your communities are staying healthy and, and safe um, and, and in these tough times, I'm incredibly humbled and grateful uh, you were able to join us. And so uh, here's to Mountain Communities, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Depending on your time zone, it's either a coffee or a beer. <laughs> Thank you. We, we, we have uh, African coffee. I think we can, we can share. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think mine's African coffee also. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> Thank you so, so much. Thank you all. Enjoy. All right. Be safe. All right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Guys. Looking forward to year three next year. <laughs> oh yeah, so we can live. It, yeah, I, I, yes, and thank you so much for joining us and for juggling, you know, the UN event with our event. I'm uh, really grateful. Oh yeah, this morning we've been on it and the, we had the the African Mountain Partnership uh, uh, Zoom as well in the morning. Ah. So it was quite fantastic. So we've been at least in three and we have another one, I think tomorrow uh, with the organized by ICMOD Nepal. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they are going to talk about a number of things, but we're going to attend something. So it is going to be uh, a busy, busy week, but the, it is good for us to interact with the rest of the, the world. Indeed, and, 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 and Bob, I have to say, your, your students are excellent. Um, really great presentations. Um, could you send information for the, Nepal, for the Nepal event? Is that open or closed? You, you have to register, so what I could do is to, uh, I can send you the, the link so that you register and you are ready to, to attend tomorrow. Excellent. Yeah, that would be wonderful if you could send that. We may have some people on this list who'd be interested. And which countries are involved in the African Mountain Partnership? Um, the, there are quite a number because uh, the African Mountain uh, Forum Partnership is uh, is hosted by the, the ACOS. ACOS is the Albertine uh, Rift. Uh, it is an organization which is concerned with uh, conservation within the Albertine Rift, covering much of the Renzori Mountain, the Virunga in Tanzania, uh, sorry, in Rwanda, Uganda, and Congo. But uh, there are quite a number of uh, countries across uh, uh, Africa, uh, for example, Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, we have Morocco as far as the north. We have uh, Cameroon. We have uh, uh, quite a lot, a lot of countries, maybe numbering up to about uh, 50, 50 countries. So they were partnering with the, with the, the, uh, the guys from FAO as well, and also the, uh, the International Mountain Partnership. And uh, yeah, so that, that, that's the, the organization uh, structure. It is part of the African, sorry, part of the mountain partnership at international level. Yeah, and so we're involved with Aspen Air National Mountain Foundation and Telluride Institute to run the North America, Central America, Caribbean. And some other time, it would be really helpful, I think, with Skylar here and, and you and me and, and, and some of my students, some of your students to talk about and compare you know, different strategies for effectively facilitating a UN region. I think we can learn a lot from you. Yeah, yes, please. We, we could do it, but uh, as you say, 
The other alternative is not to wait for the International Mountain Day. Maybe in between, we could see how we can uh, get engaged and the, we build the momentum for the next one. That could be one a possibility uh, of engaging each other, maybe through uh, either using social media or using some other uh, network communication so that we keep in touch and, and we build uh, close collaboration. That would yes. be quite good, I think. Yes, and let's let's be hopeful that uh, the human community can can get vaccines to enough people that we can all be together in Rome someday with the UN Mountain Partnership and, and meet in person. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank Professor you. Bob, and thank, thank you, you everybody. So much for organizing is not easy, but uh, we thank you so much for keeping uh, the network alive, and the, I think. Uh, it has given us a very good uh, uh, day celebration, uh, capping it with uh, the interactions which we've had with you. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks everybody. All right. <laughs> uh, peace, peace. You know, this one means what I mean. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I, I hope it doesn't mean something wrong in, in Uganda. <laughs> we are neutral. We are neutral. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I learned that about hitchhiking in, in Taiwan once. <laughs> it doesn't mean what it means here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Gratitude. Okay, please. Great. Leonie, thanks so much. That was excellent. I mean, really. Um, when we go to COP26, we're going to just have to get to those mountains with you. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Samita, now you have, I think everybody ran off the call to go to the closest Indian restaurant. You had, you got us so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, it was great to have you here and have you so active. You seemed inspired. Yeah, it was just nice to be able to do something now that I'm not freaking out about classes. <laughs> <laughs> Learning for its own sake is a, is a beautiful thing, huh? I love doing these. Yeah, and I just, Ric Ricardo, we cannot get you here soon enough. All right, well, I'll, I'll just hang out till, there, till, till my face is the only one left. I'm happy to answer questions about Center for Mountain Transitions or ways to connect. And, but, you know, I'm grateful and it was a great event, thank you. Thank you very much. It was great. Yes, thank you.